started. This is our second uh, visiting professor of the year, and uh, this is going to be a real treat. So very excited uh, for our new speaker or for our speaker for this morning. I'm going to let Winston, Dr. Guafmi, introduce him since he's such a great friend. All right. You got Mark, little... you can see me in the back here, Mark. He's working on it. Yeah. So I have my I have my system up there, but I forgot to mute myself. So Winston Guafmi, um, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Aoki. He braved the elements to come here. So Dr. Aoki is from the University of Utah. Um, kind of runs the residency uh, there and the sports fellowship there as well. Um, and he is a hip arthroscopist, so near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm not going to go way back through his background because I think he's going to talk about in the first couple of slides. But he's one of the guys that all of us and, and kind of my world look to as far as advice and guidance. He's kind of one of the four on the forefront of uh, the hip preservation as well as pediatric knee as well. So uh, when the chief residents were talking about you know, inviting different uh, grand rounds professionals this year, Steve Oki's name came up, and I was really excited. They thought you know, to bring him here. And because um, for someone like me and just trying to sort of make my way in this world, he's one who I would look up to, Steve. And so I'm glad you're here. Uh, we had a great time with him last night doing cases. He, he was able to get here through that monsoon, uh, brought the rain with him from Atlanta up here to UVA, and, uh, but was able to come to cases yesterday. I had a nice dinner last night. So Steve, thanks for coming here. I look forward to your talks and we'll have a nice day. Thanks, Winston. Uh, is my mic on? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, well, great. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate uh, having the chance to come out and speak to your group. Uh, you guys have a beautiful campus. I've always wanted to come here. My wife went here for uh, her undergrad, and so I've always heard great things, and, and you guys have a great department. So uh, I really appreciate it. This is an honor to be here. So uh, my first, I've got two talks. Uh, first talk is uh, going to be hip arthroscopy, and my and I'm going to focus on my perspective and uh, from the sense of like the the research that we've done in our group. And I, uh, you know, there's a lot of good literature out there. I want to maybe take the time to focus on the things that we've done in our group and go through the process of how I think about the the hip. And so uh, there's a lot of bias in this talk, probably. Okay, I. Winston, thank you again for the for the um, uh, invitation. So uh, this is my conflicts. Uh, so first of all, I, I got to do this because I've made a mistake once in my life in in uh, thanking, and I forgot to thank my wife, and I will never live that down. And so I just first of all, this is my family. Uh, my wife Lana, who is uh, a UVA graduate, and then my four kids. Uh, Kenji, Seiji, Kobe, and Hana, uh, anywhere from 23 down to 11 years old. So, uh, and then these are my parents. Uh, they live three doors down from us. And so I essentially still live, I, I'm in high school still. I come home from work and there's food. And so I have never grown up. I, let's see. Okay, this is my background. I, I was born in Vegas. Uh, this is me when I was three years old, uh, fishing with my dad. Uh, this was Vegas Strip back when we left uh, Vegas, back when I was four. And uh, this has changed quite a bit. Uh, Vegas has changed. There's a different Steve Aoki that now rules. Uh, and it's, uh, but I was the original OG. So I, I, we moved to Idaho Falls and this was like, you think of like those defining days uh, when you were uh, growing up. There's not a whole lot that I remember when I was uh, when I was four years old, but I remember this day. Okay, this is one of those days that I remember. We moved in our old uh, green Ford LTD. We had my parents, my brother, and our two cats, and the cats were running around in the in the car, jumping all over the place, and we're getting up to Idaho Falls, and it was the day that the Teton Dam broke. And so when we got up there, it was, it was late uh, in the evening and, and uh, the area, the, the valleys were flooded and we got to the hotel that we were supposed to stay at and they gave our room uh, to people who had to evacuate. And so we had to end up sleeping in our car and it was the only time I've seen my mom cry. So she looked at my dad and she's like, can't we just go back to Vegas? But uh, she ended up liking it there and we... Uh, that's where I grew up and that's where I did high school. So I, my education, I, I'm going to uh, divulge things that my parents don't know. I, uh, when I was in high school, 
I missed all deadlines for college and I didn't apply. And so I, I, um, there's a recruiter for Utah State that came in and I uh, was recruiting the junior, uh, the juniors at, at high school. And I went in and spoke to him and he luckily helped me get a spot at, in college. And so I, I was struggling a little bit with trying to figure out what I wanted to do because I was getting pressure to go wrestle in college. And I didn't know if that's really what I wanted to do. And then I ended up uh, switching. And after a, a year or after a couple months in, in college, I decided that that's I made a mistake. And so I applied to some of the schools that that had recruited me. And then I ended up transferring to Harvard for, for my undergrad and I wrestled there. And then I went to Mount Sinai for med school. I, and then for orthopedic training, I, I went back to uh, my area and went to the university of Utah, did my residency. And then I stayed on for the sports fellowship there. And so if you've ever been to, who's been to Salt Lake in the room, like good amount of you. Okay. It's a beautiful area. So if you're ever out there, let me know. I'd be happy to, to, uh, uh, take you around. Although I noticed that whenever you live in an area, there's, it takes people visiting for you to actually see some of the beautiful sites. So uh, if you're ever there, let me know. I, my, in my professional career, I went into private practice initially. I did three years of private practice, was waiting to see where my wife would end up uh, matching for her residency. And uh, I ended up helping out with uh, the, the, uh, pediatric trauma call. Uh, my, our pediatric staff were, were getting inundated with the call and it was getting a little challenging because they didn't have enough people to cover. So I offered to, if I was going to stick around the area that I would uh, help out with, with trauma call. And they asked me if I would. And so that's sort of how I got started with the pediatric sports side of things is just taking call. Uh, the pediatric sports started coming my way. And then uh, once my wife matched at uh, the University of Utah, then uh, I was recruited to come back to, to do, do the sports, uh, the Pete sports. And um, kind of right at the, around that same time, I, I was down at the uh, San Diego uh, for AAOS. And I, my, my shoulder, uh, my practice in, in, uh, uh, in private practice was mainly shoulders, 60, 40, uh, shoulder, knee. And I, I was at uh, Academy and I had a little block of time where I had some things that I'd that I could go just explore. And one of the, the uh, lectures was on hip arthroscopy. And so I figured I should know something about it because that's a black box of, of an area that I just don't know anything about. And so I went into this, uh, this symposium and, and listened to some of the talks and it just sort of clicked. Like it made a lot of sense that I, there's this mechanical issue with, with hip. And then you start having these epiphanies where you're looking at it like, man, all of these young ad adults that came into a uh, hip clinic that were coming in, you're like, oh, it's piriformis. Oh, it's like, you know, your glute, uh, you strain the muscle. And then you start thinking about it and you're like, man, how can we, how do we miss this? Like, and, and so like mechanically, if your mind is mechanical, it makes so much sense. And so I started to experiment a little bit with trying to figure out how am I going to find a place in this world of hip. Uh, so I went back to the University of Utah. I had started doing uh, some, some uh, uh, hip arthroscopy. The challenge of the start was, I mean, it was hard at, at, at first. I mean, I talk about like not planning. I, uh, I thought, okay, I'll start off with cadavers. And so I was in private practice at the time and I ordered some cadavers in and I'm like, okay, I'll just they'll allow me to use uh, OR and had the scope stuff there. And I got there and I got started. And I'm like, how in the world? I, I didn't even think about like distraction. And right? so I'm sitting there with a scope and a cadaver and I don't know how to get in there. So I started just kind of poking around, trying to get the scope into the hip. And finally I was just like, okay, I'm just going to use this as a dissection. So I started dissecting, going through anatomy and, and I'd get down to the capsule. And then I made a little hole and I poked in and I'm looking around and I started to learn, okay, I got to be more, I got to prepare better. Right. Uh, and so I started doing some industry courses and that's how I got started. Um, it took me about eight, nine months before I got the, uh, before I felt comfortable to start getting into the world of, of hip. I just didn't want to take it on too quickly. Uh, if you look at my, when I started at the university, uh, that first year I did 16 hip scopes. 
and then 68 the next year, then 165, and then 204. And then I'm kind of settled somewhere between 250 and 300 a year uh, currently. I like hip scopes. I've always loved the lathe. Okay? And I can remember back when I was in, in junior high, I'd be sitting at the lathe and I'd be doing woodwork. And Mr. Garbutt, my, my sh uh, shop teacher, would look at me and be like, Aoki, get off the goddamn lathe. Give someone else a chance. And, but I love the reshaping process uh, of, of uh, uh, hip arthroscopy. Okay, so I wanted to go over kind of the thought process. And I, I would like to just kind of break this down into a, diff a few different areas as far as where, uh, where we kind of do research out there in the world of hip and, and uh, try to simplify this a little bit. Uh, there's kind of the understanding what is FAI and then the, the uh, set up access, I'm gonna skip set up, set up and access and we'll probably do a little bit more of that in the lab, okay? Cause that's probably not as interesting as a, as a group here. Uh, and then I wanna go over my thoughts on, I kind of break this up into to two different sites as far as uh, mechanical and anatomy. There's the acetabular side and the femoral side. And then we wanna talk about capsular management, which is probably where uh, I've done most of my uh, academic work. Uh, these are, some of these uh, photos are just of our area in Utah in general. This is, uh, uh, these photos are done by Andy Tischer, who's one of our hand uh, faculty. He is phenomenal, but he's a great uh, photographer. Uh, so femoral acetabular impingement, uh, concept is pretty, uh, pretty simple. It's, it's a mismatch. It's, uh, you've got a ball, you've got a socket, and there's a shape mismatch between the two that uh, causes an impingement or a collision between the two sides. And just like anything mechanical, when the two sides hit, it can cause mechanical wear, all right? And so uh, this is some of our biplane fluoro work done by uh, Andy Anderson, who's one of our PhDs. Uh, he does some great work uh, and is NIH, NIH uh, funded, uh, but this is our biplane fluoro uh, uh, radio, or I'm sorry, our exam uh, uh, paper that we did looking at one of our FAI patients. So athletic considerations, uh, you know, I, I kind of look at uh, FAI as being this combination of shape on top of activity, and the two uh, come together to cause the mechanical damage. And so when you look at, uh, you know, no different than if you installed your door uh, and the door is rubbing on your floor, right? If you, if you have it scraping on your floor, it's going to damage your tile. Uh, if you don't open that door very often, it's not going to cause a whole lot of damage. And so it's it's both the shape and, and the activity and how much you use it that lead to the injury. So you have uh, patients, they're all a little bit different. There's the super physiologic motions. You can have kind of a mild uh, shape issue, but you have a, a kind of an aggressive activity that causes the, the pinching. Uh, and then the repetitive activities, you see like football, uh, hockey, and soccer, where you get these kind of very large uh, cam lesions. So etiology, uh, you get a physial stress. You can see that here where you've got the, your physial uh, scar. And then this is kind of the area where you, where you see the extra bone. I kind of think of it a little bit like Osgood Schlatter's where when you have this reactive, when, when you, when you uh, stress a, a physis through the growth period, uh, you can cause kind of a stimulation of that, that area and, and, and get extra bone. So I... Uh, Athletes, okay, just essentially the, the idea behind this slide was that you get this, this combination of the activity and the, uh, and the shape, but we've always kind of thought of FAI as a deep flexion problem. And I don't need, necessarily think that that's necessarily true. You look at, um, we have a study that came out a couple of years ago where we looked at normal hips and some CAM uh, symptomatic patients. And if you look at their, their uh, dynamic activity and, and not even deep flexion activities. There's a, there's a loading change. There's more wobble that you see with FAI patients. And so there's, I think this is more complicated than just a deep flexion issue. I, one of the issues uh, with FAI, you think of this as radiographic uh, changes, uh, but that doesn't really correlate to clinical findings. Okay. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people in this room probably that don't, that have FAI radiographic findings, but don't have hip pain. Okay. Uh, these are probably, these are our two, 
our most cited papers. Um, if you look at the, we looked at radiographic prevalence of FAI and college football players. We had, if you look at our 67 players that we brought in for films, 95% of them had radiographic findings of FAI. Only two of these individuals had symptoms, okay? We wanted to take that another step forward and we wanted to look at the senior games, okay? And so we have, uh, we're fortunate to have, this is interesting, if you, as you get older, this is, this is kind of a cool area. The, the Huntsman uh, World Games is held in St. George every year and it attracts about 10,000 uh, athletes, senior athletes over the age of, it's like I'm now senior athlete, it's over the age of 50, all right? And so, uh, and they have they have sports. They have badminton, soccer. They have bocce. They have uh, horseshoes. So there's a lot of different opportunities for a lot of different individuals. And so, if you ever want to do a study in senior athletes, oh my goodness! These like we set up a booth, and people were going around. It's like the free pen. You know, they were going from booth to booth to collect their you know free things, their stickers, and they came to our booth and they're like what do I get? And we're like, you get radiographs. They're like, awesome. <laughs> and so, and, and everyone, there were people were lining up, waiting in line to get their radiographs. And it's like, and so it was very easy to recruit. And so we had 547 senior athletes where we got films on. And, uh, you know, 83% of them had FAI findings. Okay. 10% DDH. And the, the interesting thing about the study is that 93% of the uh, the hips that had osteoarthritis had FAI findings, but 81% of the FAI hips showed little or no OA. Okay. And if you look at uh, these uh, individuals, the other thing that I think is uh, important is that lifetime risk of, uh, or li lifetime risk of arthritis was also related to, to lifetime activity, which kind of makes sense. You drive your car more, it's going to break down. Uh, so my thoughts overall, like the, the concept of FAI, uh, you need to correlate the hip morphology with the symptoms. Uh, that symptomatic FAI is both a shape and activity issue, and kinematics are way more complicated than we think. And those are things that we got to answer. All right. Okay, so I want to switch over to the acetabulum. Yeah. Just a quick question. You're, when you talked about that study that showed uh, mechanics are different, say, during low flexion activity, yeah. do you think that's a chicken or the egg? Do you think that's the problem because they now have FAI, their mechanics have changed? Or do you think that their mechanics have always been bad and that's not that bad? Yeah, good question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I guess I would, I would, I think personally, I think that they're different. I think that the, the, the shape issue plays a role in how their hip uh, mechanically moves. And, and I bet you if we took non-symptom, if we took individuals that are not symptomatic, I bet you we would see the same wobble. But I don't know that. Uh, we, we have not looked at that. All right, so that's tabulum. So I'm going to briefly talk about labral, labral tears and labral repairs. I actually think my personal opinion, uh, and this is just opinion, uh, is that uh, the labrum is maybe not as important uh, as, as uh, from, a, from a clinical and symptomatic side of things. If you look at uh, oftentimes where we look at the labrum when we get into the hip, the labrum looks pretty reasonable. It's the chondrolabral junction where we see a lot of the breakdown. And so, I don't know, I hear I repair the labrum and my labrum looks like it's kind of in the same place, you know? And so I, my personal opinions, there's a lot of things that go on in the world of labral, uh, labral treatments, whether it's debriding or uh, repairing or augmenting or rebuilding, reconstructing. And the, the results seem to be pretty good. It, Regardless of what you do, I think the one thing that I would say you don't do is you re you don't resect it, okay. And so, I I'm going to briefly just talk about labrums. I want to uh, spend a little bit more time talking about shape of of the hip because I think that that's where things uh, are a little bit more interesting. Uh, if you look at acetabular mechanics, we've got the dysplasia, which is the shallow hip, and then the overcovered, okay. And so there's good and bad with both, okay. So you know in dysplasia when you have a shallow hip. The bad is you get point loading, there's less coverage, there's more stress going to a certain area concentrated in, this, in, in that roof of your, of your acetabulum. And these are the hips that are more at risk of instability. Okay? The good uh, of uh, being an overcovered hip is that you have better distribution of the load. If you have 100 pounds of weight going through your hip 
and you have a deeper hip, it's distributed over a greater area. So there's less stress to the cartilage. It's more stable. Okay. On the other hand, dysplasia is good because you've got be better range of motion. Uh, but in the overcovered hip, the pincer hip, uh, you have limited motion and bony contact occurs earlier. So pincer impingement, we think of it like retroversion, uh, low hanging uh, anterior inferior iliac spine, global over coverage with profunda protrusio, and then labral ossifications. Okay. Uh, this is one of our uh, exam uh, patients that we had. This is a true protrusio hip. And, and you know, it does affect, you know, the, the true deep hip uh, has less motion. Okay. And so I, uh, there's, I think there is a difference between the Petruzio and some of the other kind of slightly deeper hips as far as what we get for pathology. I, uh, this is not my data, but it, I think it's important to, to build the picture. Pincer FAI, like a lot of things in orthopedics, you can find articles that support what you want to do. And you can find other articles that don't support what you want to do. And you oftentimes kind of find the ones that support your, your position and then you use those. So I think it's important to just talk about pincer FAI. There are, there are studies that say that there's no incidence of a deep hip causing uh, arthritis. And then there are other studies that say it does. Okay. And so I don't know if we necessarily know the answer here, uh, but in general, I tend to lean more towards uh, not wanting to do a whole lot on the, on the acetabular side in order to address FAI, because uh, there are certain issues that, that you see through practice where there have been mistakes that have occurred. Here's one of them. This is an individual who had a hip scope done. Uh, if you can, you can see up through here that the acetabular roof was over trimmed. And we've got a hip that is now kind of iatrogenically dysplastic. And these are the hips that go on to start. You can see that how the hip is starting to spit out and it's starting to get unstable because it's no longer got the coverage. And this individual went on to get a hip replacement. Okay. I, these are the types of individuals that this is an older uh, video from, from my practice, but uh, when I do an acetabuloplasty, I'm really kind of focusing on just the area where it allows me to, to uh, technically do the things like the labral repair. So if I get an ossification of that front rim, I'll just trim it so I get a flat area so I can place, place uh, my anchors. I, I think the thing that I would point out here is that when you do acetabular bony work, there's a trade-off here. This is not like, okay, just do the bone work and everything is great. If you look at what I've done here, in order to get to the bone, there's some damage to the, to the capsule, to the soft tissue surrounding the hip joint. Okay. And so it's not like it doesn't come with some potential uh, malefacts. I, this is sort of a standard, or this is a, I, uh, low-hanging AIIS. These are the individuals that I'll take on as far as doing more of a rim trim. Okay, this is a uh, previous uh, AIS fracture filled in, healed in a low position. Here's the AIS, has a little bit of HO in the rectus as well. So these are the individuals that I'll take on and, and do more of an acetabular work. Uh, but again, th these are kind of spot ca cases. Otherwise, I'm very, uh, personally, I'm very... Uh, conservative on the side. So this is looking on the inside of the hip joint. Here's the cherry red spot from the impingement. This is uh, halfway taking down that, that uh, area and then just kind of recreating anatomy, okay? Uh, so thoughts on acetabular uh, side. I Coverage is a good thing unless you pinch, right? I try to get most of my clearance on the femoral side. Uh, there's a trade-off. If you're going to do bony work and you start getting aggressive with the bony work, you just have to make sure you're not damaging the things around you. Okay. Your soft tissue, your labrum, your capsule. Currently, I, this is the area where I think pincer is not as well understood as, uh, as uh, the femoral side. Questions on that. Okay. So we'll go to the femoral side. This is Bryce Canyon down South in Utah, a uh, beautiful area. Okay. Femoral mechanics. I, 
just to simplify this for those in the room that maybe don't understand FAI as much, this is, it's a shape issue. There's a socket, there's a ball. If the ball doesn't fit in the socket, it, it causes mechanical breakdown. More round, normal, less round, uh, more, more likely to, to uh, have FAI symptoms. Uh, so I think when we're talking technically about, uh, about FAI and, and cam impingement, you know, our goal is to try to do something surgically that reshapes the hip joint so that it fits. But we have to be careful about kind of this under versus over resection. If we look at revisions and redo surgeries, most of the time we think of it as being uh, an issue related to not taking enough bone. But we're also understanding how over resection and taking too much bone can cause problems. These are the, the hips where when they walk into clinic, I don't know about uh, Winston and Chuck, these are the ones that I worry about. These are the hips. When I see this in clinic, I'm worried because in order for someone who uh, doesn't do this very often to get this much bone taken away, they usually have to open up the hip and cause more damage to the, to the soft tissues. And so these are the ones that have, these are more difficult uh, revisions to deal with. Goal here is to try to get a little bit more of a rounding to the joints so that it fits, okay? So I think first step for the cam side is to understand the morphology, understand the radiographs, understand what you're looking at. There are early, when I was uh, starting out, there was um, uh, individuals that I went to go visit and, and they're talking about, you know, making sure that when you're doing, when you're taking bone, that you're taking bone and if your radiographs or your fluoro spots aren't showing that you're taking bone, you're not in the right plane. So don't keep taking bone, okay? Because then you end up with those, those big divots, all right? So uh, if you look at radiographs, uh, you have to make sure that you know, understand which radiographs you're taking and how it correlates to the area of the clock face uh, so that you can identify the cam lesion. So this is one of the papers that we, we uh, looked at uh, digitally reconstructed radiographs of our CTs and just kind of localized where we would, where, where you're looking when you, when you get your series. Okay, my, my preference is to get a, a weight bearing AP, a modified false profile, uh, so that I can look at the acetabular coverage. And then uh, I like a, a 45 done so that I can look at that one to two o'clock position and then a frog leg to look at that three o'clock position. And most of the time I would look at and say radiographs to me help me understand uh, FAI or CAM type morphology better than MRIs. Okay, advanced imaging, MRs and CTs give you a little bit more. And I would encourage you if you're, when you're first starting out, I, th I do think that CT scans are, are helpful to help visualize, but once you start getting comfortable, it gets easier to not deal with CTs as much just because of the radiation. Particularly, you have to be careful with uh, younger females, okay? Because there's, there, there's a risk with radiation. <laughs> okay, determining the depth of resection. I think this is an area, I personally think that this is probably one of our best papers that we've put out in our group uh, looking at the sclerosis. And so if you look at where we have a cam lesion, the sclerosis really helps me determine how much bone to take, right? And I think that this is really the only paper out there that talks about sort of quantitatively how much bone should you take, All right? So I always look at my pre-op radiographs and kind of get an idea of how much bone needs to be taken. You don't have to take a lot. So we looked at this and in, in, uh, I, I essentially blinded our PhD stu uh, uh, student downstairs uh, to take the CTs that we had. And I I'd asked her to just take away the sclerosis in the front of the, the uh, CT and just do a, a simulated uh, uh, mapping of the sclerosis. And so she went through and, and took the, the sclerosis down. And then, and then we looked at this. And so if we looked at the, the hips and looked at the simulated resection. And by doing just taking that sclerotic bone, we're able to restore the, the sphericity to within uh, submillimetric uh, differences to normal hips. So uh, this is how I do the, a uh, cam takedown. I do a trough technique where first thing I do is I take down, I, I step off and uh, take down a depth 
and I remove the sclerotic bone in the front, and then whoops, and then I round out the the uh, head neck junction, and then I finish off the the uh, bottom area. So this is it in in uh, for an example. I identify the top. I identify uh, more medially, and then I step off about eight to 10 millimeters and I just make a trough and I'll just take this down until I break through the, uh, the sclerotic bone. And I start seeing that flush of the, of the subchondral bone. And once I get that flush of the subchondral bone, uh, then I know that I've gone deep enough. Okay, and that's a pretty good uh, indicator of how much bone you should take, right? So then I, I'll go down and I'll use medial synovial fold, which is a landmark uh, down on the, on, on the medial side of the hip to, to kind of identify where the bottom of the uh, lesion is. And then, so once I've got that trough, then I'll round out. And so then it's just, and uh, this is the boring part for the scrubs and the medical students and everyone around, because this is, this is where you're just taking and removing bone and everyone's just watching you take down bone. So, and I want to see clearance, okay? And so this is kind of dynamic exam. You can see where we've taken bone and where we haven't, and you can kind of see where, where we haven't taken, and you still get that pinching at the labral junction. And then you just keep rounding it out until you get uh, a uh, more spherical surface. And I think that when you're doing this technically, it's, it's challenging to, uh, to get to all the different areas. It, it's getting down down the, the length of the neck, getting up around the 12 o'clock position as you go up on the top of the hip, it can be challenging to visualize and get to. So that's sort of the first area I'll do the head neck junction first, and then I'll go down and, and work on the uh, neck side to uh, plane this out and get it to uh, more sphericity. Uh, and so when do you, how do you know you're done? Essentially, I'll do a dynamic exam and I'll make sure that I do radio, uh, I'll do fluoroscopy. You know, some people don't like to use fluoroscopy. I think it's a good check for me. Uh, and I, I don't know if there'll ever be a time when I won't use fluoroscopy because I always feel like I, it helps me get a little bit better as far as uh, uh, my ability to, to reshape. So identify uh, the morphology. Cam lesions are quite different from one to another. Uh, if you're, when you're first starting out in practice for the trainees, uh, pick and choose what you take on because there are some that are hard and some that are a lot easier. All right, capsular management. This is sort of where I've done most of my work uh, academically. Uh, and, you know, it's like a lot of things in, in your career. There are times when you uh, hurt people and you recognize a problem. And this is what happened with capsular management for me. Uh, just uh, from an anatomy standpoint, for all of you who maybe aren't familiar with, with what we do, uh, hip arthroscopy wise, there's the iliofemoral ligament in the front of the hip, which is the really important area. It's a strong limit uh, ligament. If you, if you suction this, it increases movement of the hip and can uh, cause instability. Uh, when we do uh, hip arthroscopy, most of the time, we're doing some sort of violation of this ligament. So why am I scared of the capsule? This is one of my patients, um, oh, two, three years out uh, when I first started. Uh, this is a, a patient that came to see me, hip pain, mildly dysplastic. I did a hip scope. Six weeks later, she was coaching her uh, daughter's soccer team. She stepped, pivoted, dislocated her hip. Okay, when I was in training, all hip dislocations were posterior. I mean, we have in the world of hip arthroscopy, we have single-handedly increased the number of anterior dislocations uh, iatrogenically. Okay, and so I treated her for in a brace. I immobilized her for a while, tried to get her to scar in. At one year, she was um, still dealing with issues where she was not getting to her functional goals. I took her back for a revision. And when I pulled on her hip to distract her, her hip was really loose. So I repaired her capsule. And so she is kind of a practice changing uh, individual for me that kind of made me understand the importance of the capsule. This is my second hip that dislocated, a non-dysplastic hip. 
labral repair, osteoplasty. A couple of weeks after the surgery, he was sleepwalking, and this happened. Okay, this guy went on to have arthritis and needed a total hip. All right, so I was looking at this guy thinking, I am in trouble. All of these people that I've scoped, they're going to start coming back and having issues. Luckily, that's not the case. But uh, if you look at catastrophic instability after hip arthroscopy, uh, if you look at all the, there, there are way more cases out there in the, uh, out there in the world than just the few case reports that have been reported. Uh, but if you look at the risk factors, no capsule repair, DDH, iliopsoas releases, hypermobility, female patients. When you're dealing with uh, FAI, you have to see, okay? I, I think it's like anything you do surgically. If you can't visualize, if you can't do the work, I mean, we're not going in to, to do a capsulotomy. Our goal is to do the FAI work. Okay. And so, but the capsulotomy and, and the capsular management is important because we don't want to cause other issues. So you have to be able to see, you have to be able to, to visualize. And depending on how you want to do this technically, I, uh, you learn from your mentors. Okay. But, but make sure that you aren't forgetting why you're there. Okay. You need to be able to deal with the underlying FAI. Regardless of what you choose, interportal, periportal, T cuts, uh, there are different uh, ways to approach the capsule. The goal is the same. Okay. You want to address the underlying pathology, but you don't want to cause other problems. So there's this balance, right? There's minimally disruptive capsular uh, techniques. And then there's other techniques where you open it up and you can see everything, right? I tell our trainees that are our fellows that are going to go out and do uh, hip arthroscopy, like do what you need to do initially so that you can get to a point where you're comfortable as you start uh, maturing in your practice, things will get smaller. Your incisions will get smaller. Your capsulotomies, capsulotomies will get smaller and uh, it'll, uh, you'll get technically more proficient, All right? This is a T type. I, I don't T very often, uh, but it's essentially making that cut through iliofemoral ligament and then down uh, the neck. And it essentially opens that area up and you can see everything. It requires very little movement of the hip. You can just identify the cam lesion and you can take it down. Okay. But you got to close it. Right? Well, that's my opinion. Uh, inner portal. This is what I did for the majority of my career until just a couple of years ago. So this is just uh, a, the incision uh, through the capsulotomy. And then uh, I place stitches across and essentially put figure of eight stitches, usually three to four of them, and, and uh, try to get as tight of a watertight closure as I could possibly get uh, and, uh, and try to get that tissue to heal. All right? uh, this, I think, is... I really do think that when you're looking at uh, hip patients that uh, have FAI that are still having symptoms, it's oftentimes this problem. It either attenuates, it re-tears, uh, but you, know, you look at anything, like you look at a boxer, they get a cut on their eye, so what up, a year later, have another fight, get hit, where do you cut? You cut through scar planes, right? It's never as strong. This is what I'm doing now. This is a periportal approach. Uh, so this is extra capsular. This is looking outside the capsule. Uh, here's the por portal. The, this is our, my, our side portal called the AL portal. This is our anterior portal on the other side. And I'm working through portals and I'm using stitches to uh, elevate my capsule so that I can see, so I can help minimize. I'm trying to keep that iliofemoral ligament intact so that I can, I can uh, preserve that tissue so I'm not uh, causing iatrogenic problems. Okay, and so this is just the visualization after some traction stitches. Uh, this is my closure uh, of the anterior portal. Uh, and then this is my closure of the uh, anterior lateral portal. So the bridge between the two, trying to, again, uh, re restore and maintain that, that capsular envelope. So do you repair the, again, like anything in, in orthopedics, 
for and against. You can support. This was fascinating at the ISHA, which is the International Hip Arthroscopy uh, meeting. We had a, a debate looking at repair the capsule, don't repair the capsule. And at the end of the debate, like the majority of the room was like, don't repair the capsule. Yeah, cheer. And, and uh, it's fascinating. So uh, anyway, the, it's, it's not my opinion, but you can find opinions of, of uh, what you want to do. I really do think that this is an important aspect of, of hip arthroscopy. Uh, we did some uh, papers looking at uh, restoring the, the anatomy of the capsule. And so we looked at doing a traction uh, inside the hip. Uh, we essentially pull on the hip uh, at 25 pound intervals, uh, looking at the amount of distraction uh, prior to doing anything and violating the, the hip after a capsulotomy and then uh, after repairing. And we're able to, this is the red is the capsulotomy state and then the black and the gray are the uh, after repair with our with our distraction, essentially showing that, that uh, you can restore the the native mechanics of the of the uh, hip joint. I so just taking a, a, a hypothetical patient, you know, continued pain after a previous hip scope, you find that they have an adequate osteo, uh, osteoplasty. It was a really straightforward hip. I always again think of capsular uh, inst instability. So these are three different patients with kind of a redundant uh, capsule, slight uh, outpouching out of the capsule with a defect. If you look here, here's capsule, here's capsule, this is scar. And then this, this is like a frank uh, uh, extravasation of, of fluid. When we looked at our patients, I have, these are mostly my patients. These are patients that only had a capsular repair at their revision. No labral repairs, no osteoplasties, right? This is, and we try to look at what they, what was their presentation in clinic? These are hard. Oftentimes they come back and they're just complaining, I'm no better. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very difficult uh, patient population, right? 87% of them had pain with their activities of daily living. All of them hurt with sports. I, only 25% of these patients complained of, my hip feels loose. It feels unstable. Okay. I, I do an axial distraction test, which I'll, I'll uh, demonstrate here in a little bit. But when I do the test, I look at pain, apprehension, toggling. Uh, and then all of them had um, uh, capsular defects. And at four years uh, after doing an uh, isolated capsule repair, 87 improved with activity, 78% improved with their pain complaints. So here's a physical exam. I look at drop the leg, extend, see if that hurts, do a dial test. And I look at symmetry between the two sides, looking to see if you look at a hip that has capsular insufficiency, the foot will turn out more typically. Uh, and, and it has a softer endpoint when you bring the feet and you turn it outward, All right? Oh, whoops, axial distraction test. This is testing the affected side. There's the apprehension. You'll see that hip toggle. The, the hip will come out right here, okay? And so that's, that's the apprehension that she has too, where she, she uh, doesn't like the feeling of that hip being pulled I, we looked at our patients that have hip instability afterwards, and I would always recommend that you get an MRI, MR arthrogram because it blows up the capsule and allows you to see the defects. This is the same patient. Okay, so this is two examples, someone who had an MRI, and then we obtained an MRA afterwards, and you can see that it looks pretty decent on the MRIs. You can see the defect on the MRA. Same thing here. This is just another example of an individual who got an MRI. And then when we got the MRA, you could see, you can identify that, that lesion. I, this is just our original uh, report of looking at individuals who had the isolated capsule repair uh, improvement of symptoms. This is the intraoperative exam. So this is the one thing that most of us in the hip world can agree. I, that instability, like getting a good uh, exam under anesthesia, 
gives you an idea of the stability and you can just take and pull with a couple fingers and, and distract the hip. That's an unstable hip typically. Uh, this is that patient that uh, uh, from before, this is the, the apprehension. And again, you'll see this toggle here and right there. I, I did a isolated capsule repair on her and this is her on, on follow-up. And so she's got that stability. She's doing very well. So my thoughts with a capsule, regardless of how meticulous you are with a capsular repair, if someone is having issues after a surgery, a hip arthroscopy, you always have to look at the capsular integrity, okay? Minimizing problems with hip arthroscopy. For those of you who are going to be doing it in practice, uh, know your limitations initially. Again, don't think of it as like all hip scopes are the same. Uh, they're not. There are some that are really challenging. The big cam lesions, pistol grip deformities where they extend over the top. Uh, try to find those ones that are sort of that isolated sclerosis in the front of the hip. They don't, they don't have the big pistol grip deformity. They're not dysplastic. Okay. They're, they're not hypermobile. All right. Those are the, those are ones that to uh, focus on. I always tell my uh, fellows that when you start off, if you notice that it's taking you a long time, you're probably, you're probably more, uh, you're getting more benefit by really focusing on doing a good osteoplasty and uh, don't worry so much about the acetabular side. Okay. Oh, this is, I got This is I actually think that this is one of our, our best studies too. So we did, there are not very many double blind randomized placebo controlled trials in orthopedics. Okay. And we, we looked at uh, early in our practice, we looked at using the uh, NSAIDs for, for uh, prevention of HO and taking uh, the anti-inflammatories, 4% risk of HO, not taking it, 46% risk of HO. So it's important to, to treat that, okay? And, and give an anti-inflammatory. This is at Academy, Las Vegas, Friday, 6 p.m., all right? One of the only double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials in orthopedics. This is one of our residents presenting. And hopefully this isn't a talk that you guys are falling asleep in. So, uh, but anyway, this is... Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah. What do you do with the hip that has too much femoral bone taken away? You showed that picture of the guy with yeah. the over resection. So there's there's not there's not a great answer right now. Okay, so one of the thing, one of the technical aspects that is being done by Mark Philippon is he built that defect with soft tissue to try to hopefully provide some sort of fill. Like it vaginates the capsule down under there or uh, uh, it takes it takes IT band. Puts it in and essentially puts, yeah, puts allograph to what we make. I'm not, I don't know what the answer is. What would their symptoms be? I mean, it, obviously, if they fracture, that's a problem, but we, yeah. they came to you and said something doesn't feel right or it's still not right. Sure. You know, too much bone taken, but what would their symptoms yeah, be? Yeah, I personally think that it's part of the instability uh, picture because you increase the, the uh, intraarticular volume and it allows for that, that hip to have more movement. So for me, it's addressing the stability side, doing what I need to do on the labral side, doing what I need to do on the uh, capsular side, but also looking at it and saying, okay, is this someone who's unstable enough where uh, do they need more coverage? Do they, need, do they somehow need to have more bony support, PAO? John. Thanks, Steve. This is a great talk. In terms of um, kind of technical pearls for label repair, yeah. um, is there like a standard number of like label anchors you place? Uh, do you feel like there's a difference between knotted versus knotless anchors? For sure. Anchors, which is like for any of those things, or do you feel like it doesn't really matter? I don't know if it matters so much. I have, I certainly have technical preferences of how I do it, but 
I would look at it. I try to put an anchor for every clock face position. So I'm doing on one, two, three. I'll target. I've become less uh, aggressive with the number of anchors that I put in because I'm taking down, because I'm so scared of damaging the soft tissue around the hip, I, I want to minimize taking down that tissue. So I'll go in and I'll look at, when I first go into the hip, I'll look at the area of the labor and I'll look to see which area is sagging, disrupted at the chondrolabral junction and I'll focus on that area. And I'll take down behind it, I'll, I'll use coag, and I'll just kind of gently take that area down, get down the bone, and I won't even put a burr in there anymore. I'll, I'll use my shaver, and I'll just, and I'll roughen up that edge. Uh, unless I have something where I'm more ossified, where it's harder to get the angle. Uh, and then I'll put my, my anchors, and I'll, and I'll focus on that area, and not take down the area around. I won't, I won't, you now we kind of zip it and then it all falls in, and then you're repairing. I kind of feel like we're repairing uh, areas that we're taking down and making less stable. So I've been, I've been more conservative. I don't know if I, I don't have an answer for I not this versus not it. I like tying knots, uh, but I also like it from a teaching standpoint. So I think you have to be able to tie knots because uh, it, it's, you got to be able to do that. And then uh, it's, if we don't tie knots, it makes it harder for, for uh, individuals to, to deal with knot tying when they go out and practice. What's, so two questions. At first, at first, I think I speak for everybody the best brand rounds talk ever in this building. <laughs> <laughs> so, follow on Chuck's question. Do you think rim prep is important? Like, do you think the label heals these little spot welds? I mean, because I feel like in the shoulder, in the bank guard, like getting the glenoid prepared so the label can heal. Like that to me, the biology of that seems sure like there's value, or do you just put an anchor in and just sort of spot load it there? I, I'll go down to fall, and then I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just roughen up the surface of the bone, but I, I'm not looking to take bone anymore in most individuals. Second question: What are you doing now? You didn't do 15. You've been doing this. For 15 years now. What What do you do in 2023? You don't. You didn't do it in I well, a lot of things. Uh, you know, if you look at I look at my hip arthroscopy from beginning to now and, and kind of look at the bigger changes that I think have affected my outcomes and improved my outcomes. Uh, number one, it's understanding, it's understanding how to get into a hip atraumatically. Number one, I think is really helpful because I, there are complicated hips that are more challenging to get in. And they're not always necessarily individuals that don't distract. They, they're individuals that have like hypertrophic labrums. There's, there's a lot of little, little uh, differences between patient to patient that I mean, trying to get in and not cause damage is, is number one. Number two, repairing the capsule. If you look at my patient population, as far as like how they, when you make a, 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 a change and you look at uh, clinical outcomes before and after. Uh, being good about soft tissue management was a was a big deal. Um, <clears throat> soft tissue to me is the biggest change. Absolutely. So you mentioned that the ISHA meeting, there were a bunch of people applauding. Yeah. And not closing the caps to one and up. What's the rationale for not closing the caps? Uh, technically, it takes time. <laughs> and, and, and there, well, and there's a lot of individuals who, if you're starting to, uh, I'll look at my patient population. If I look at the individuals where as your, as your practice sort of grows and you start seeing different patients that come through, the individuals, if, I think a lot of individuals will say, kind of focus on the male a cam lesion, they're a little bit stiffer. Those patients probably don't need a, a cast repair all the time. And I do it because I think it's important and, and it's all I have some individuals that are male patients that have had capsular instability issues. And so I'll lie. That's my preference. It is, I think, I don't know, Chuck Winston, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I think it is an issue that it takes time. It's not technically easy to do. My first like three years of practice, every single time I went to close caps, the entire operating room just gasped. Oh, 
<laughs> 45 more minutes of our days because it would take a long time to close. Now, having done it for 10 years, closing capsules of four or five minutes. Yeah. And you look historically, like the other thing that I think is interesting is, you know, you look historically there, when I started a hip arthroscopy, people were saying, not presenting on this, but, but, but the dogma was, this is not a female problem, right? That, that this was a male problem and females don't do well with the surgery. Well, there's probably a reason why they weren't doing well. And that's probably that they, they would get the surgery and they had instability afterwards. And it just was undiagnosed. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on the second talk. So you mentioned PAO earlier as possible thing. Do you do your own PAOs or do you, how do you I do don't, that? I have great partners who are really good at that. Is that. I mean, do they do also hip arthroscopy or is it no. PAO, like PAO and then you so guys to sort of figure out which cases need sort of a combined Sure, order. yeah. And, and there's, we'll do it combined occasionally. And then I think one of the challenges is just the, when you have individuals that have very, uh, mature practices and they operate on different days, it can be very challenging. And so oftentimes in our institution, it ends up being try to target the one that you think is the more important. And you know, a lot of the times people are doing all right and then if they still have issues to do the other. All right, so uh, next talk, lessons learned, practice changing cases and other career thoughts. Um, this is a little bit of a challenging topic. To, to put together. I, I had some cases in mind that there are certain cases that I remember that that uh, are kind of the cases that haunt you. And one of the challenges I had with, with this, uh, this talk is that from a IT standpoint, the one of the hospitals that I'm at, they purge all studies after 10 years. And so none of my, none of the early cases were available to show anything of substance. So we can talk about those if, if we have some time, but I had to pivot a little bit. Okay. And so this is a, this is a little bit of a, you know, I think if I look at the, the cases that are practice changing for me, they aren't always like technical issues. Uh, oftentimes it's like a philosophical change where you kind of just started thinking about people differently. You know, technical issues, we all kind of make technical mistakes at times that you, you change up how you do something. But, but I think the, the cases that really kind of stick with me are things that I maybe could have done better with communicating uh, and talking to patients. So in conflicts, um, case one. So this is a, this is early. This is one of my first skippies that I dealt with uh, in in practice, this is a skiffy patient that has a pretty large uh, cam secondary to the to the skiffy. I uh, that's not the the lesson here for me. Uh, this was one of those interesting uh, cases where number one, it was hard. It was one of the harder hips that I had to scope uh, initially when I was in uh, in the first four or five years of my practice. I uh, the more the interesting issue related to this was how early in the range of motion, the hardware impinged on the hip, okay? I, if you look at this screw here, this was, the, this was the first patient that I came across where when I was doing a dynamic exam, it took very little uh, range of motion with, with flexion to get that hip, to get that screw to come up and engage it essentially came up and engaged right around the time when the bone engaged. Okay. And so this was the impetus for our, our study that we looked at with hardware impingement. And, you know, this is, this is actually a great example. You look at the screw here for a skiffy, like a pin, this does not look very close to the rim. Right. But this is, whoops. Is there a way? Oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, so essentially the video would show. I you can see with the hip in extension, you can see that hip, that screw in the front, and it only took. And we looked at the measurement of 
uh, of angle of when we could get that screw up to, to hit the, the labrum. And it was only about 50 degrees. And so these screws hit early. Uh, our study looked at uh, this dynamic exam and, uh, you know, 30% of our uh, patients had screws that impinged on dynamic exam. Uh, and if you have a screw that is, you know, it's obviously like the screw angle when you have a, a more significant slip is more at risk, but screws that are less than 55 degree, uh, millimeters are the ones that are more likely to impinge. And so this is just one of those, uh, those cases that made you start thinking about like, wow, you know, you kind of look at a radiograph and you sort of look at perspective of where something is located and you think it's far away and it really isn't that far away. Here's uh, a patient just actually in the last, uh, last few months that I, I dealt with had an osteoid osteoma uh, that um, was treated with ablation and their uh, needle broke. And after the case, she had more severe pain and she, she was, would not flex her hip. All right. And it looks pretty far down. You know, you look at where that, that uh, uh, needle is, it, it looks pretty far down to a point where it maybe doesn't affect uh, or mechanically affect the hip. But if you look at inside the joint, it's right there. You know, and, and so here's the, that uh, needle and it's hitting right at the labrum. There's some cartilage. I didn't have great video of the cartilage area where it was scraping, but I uh, essentially, we just took out the, the needle. She's doing great. Like she can flex her hip now. Another case, this was a uh, femoral neck fracture that got a uh, inferior buttress plate. And this is the joint, okay? I, that anterior wear, cartilage on the femoral side looks good. And this is the, this is not a whole lot of flexion. Uh, and it's just bringing the hip up and rolling it back and forth. And that's where the plate was coming in and, and uh, eroding on the acetabular side. So it looks kind of far away, doesn't it? Or it looks like in a, in a location where it probably shouldn't, be that big of a deal, but anyway, hip scopes aren't all the same. Hardware around the hip joint, uh, it's a little disorienting as far as looking at where it is and how it affects dynamically, all right? Case two, I, going back to the patient that dislocated, Right. This is for me, like academically, this was the case that really made me think about, about uh, the capsular management and, and the importance of, uh, of making sure you don't violate that tissue uh, or that you don't disrupt it and don't disregard that tissue. Uh, but, but it wasn't necessarily even like the technical aspects of this. You know, it, it, this case taught me that you know, it was one of those cases early that really just kind of reinforced that, that we're best as orthopedists most of the time when we're minimizing other trauma, when we're recreating anatomy, right? And it's important to, to remember those principles. Um, I think the learning point for me was, I can think of two specific patients uh, that I was dealing with early in my practice where, yeah, the osteoplasty looked good. The labrum, I thought I did a good job with. The films looked okay. And they were just looking at me with that look, that's that intense look of like, I'm no better. And I, looking back at my practice, I kind of can't help you, you know? And, and I kind of brushed it off as like, this is more than just, you know, uh, that, that there's other psychosocial issues related to, to these individuals. And while that may be true, they, they had hip instability and I just didn't recognize it. And so uh, that was a little bit of a wake up call for me to make sure that when I'm dealing with individuals that I, that maybe I have 
symptoms that are a little bit out of proportion, that I'm at least taking them seriously and that I'm having that, those hard discussions about while we, under, we understand a lot in orthopedics, we don't understand everything. And unfortunately, I, I approach it differently when I talk to these individuals now. I, I approach it in a way of like, look, I, I don't have a great answer structurally for you, uh, but I hear you still. Case three, uh, this is a young teenage female, had an injury while playing soccer, stepped in a pothole, had now is having this issue, okay? How do you make it better? Well, I walk on the outer side of my foot and it goes away, okay? She has seen five providers, she has had an extensive workup, radiographs, MRI, CT, everything's normal. As you can tell, she's had a previous knee scope, which made her better for about four months. And then she had a re-injury and now she's back to where she was. Okay. Diagnosis, anyone? Conversion, conversion disorder, okay? And so, I mean, I, Pete's orthopedists in the room, I mean, you see this in your clinics, like I would imagine, I mean, yeah, all the time, right? At different, at different levels, right? You know, there's the ones that aren't so, aren't so uh, pronounced, and then there's subtle uh, issues related to, to this. But so the, for me, the lesson learned here was talking to patients, okay? That I actually did not have a very good uh, relationship with this patient and their family when they first came in and I didn't read them well. And having that conversation with someone at the first visit was probably not the right thing to do. And I needed to, this is, this person changed how I address this because this is a challenging uh, issue. This is not necessarily what we as orthopedists want to be dealing with because these become long discussions. These are 45, 60 minute discussions, right? And I, they, this is, I, this is one that sticks out because I got a press gainy on this that was, uh, amazing because it was he only spent five minutes with me and I know that that was not correct uh, and they ended up going somewhere else and having another knee scope right and I these are individuals that I will get better with the treatment but unless you're dealing with the underlying issues that cause the somatoform or conversion disorder issues the underlying stressors the anxiety the depression it becomes, it just comes back or the, it presents itself in different ways, you know, headaches, belly pain. I, and so having those uh, hard discussions uh, or finding someone or having someone who can have those discussions is important. Case four, I, 20 year old football player, injury of practice, immediate right hip pain, diagnosis previously of, of hip impingement. Films, this was his initial films that he, he had obtained. Uh, initial treatment was uh, work with PT and the trainers. Uh, got started on an anti-inflammatory, continued to have uh, pain. Uh, after about six weeks of dealing with uh, continued discomfort, he had an intraarticular steroid injection and had an MRI. So this is his MRI. Yeah, a little bit of edema up in the uh, acetabulum here. Okay, but otherwise kind of straightforward FAI. Do you guys see anything else, Chuck Winston? Okay. Two weeks after the MRI, 
This is when he presented to me, uh, had an injection reported, 90% relief with the injection. Uh, pain was better, had not yet gone back to sports. Uh, overall function he rated as 90%. Uh, timing was, I saw him in July, competitive season, uh, football was starting uh, a month away. So we just, our plan was to continue with anti-inflammatories, uh, modify training, uh, and attempt to play. Do you guys, any, anything different? Anything different? Okay. So he had good and bad days, uh, as the season started and, uh, played sparingly because hip pain continued to slow him down, play to play here and there. In December, he had another episode in practice and he was like, look, I'm done. I got a, I saw him in the training room and, and he had discomfort. He was a little bit more global discomfort at that point. And I said, look, look, let's just pick a day. Let's, 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 let's just move forward. You guys, would you do anything else? Okay, good. Good plan. Scope. So pretty terrible, huh? All right. So this is, um, I'm assuming, well, let's just watch the video for a little bit. So not, not a great healthy hip, uh, chondral breakdown, missing cartilage. I'm sitting in the OR. I don't know what I'm going to do. Like I'm planning on doing F FAI surgery and, I'm looking at this. I he's kind of expecting me to do an osteoplasty. I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but I went forward and I and I did the reshaping. Uh, I did a little abrasion arthroplasty on him. I and and I did I did move forward and I just did what I was planning on doing because uh, I I assumed that he was not going to be happy if I bailed on that. Uh, it did help. I had to, to reshape, but he still had discomfort. This is a periportal again. This is, I throw a figure of eight in that, in that portal and close it. Uh, and so, uh, this is him post-op. He's a little narrow, right? He's kind of, he hasn't gotten more, he hasn't worsened as far as the, the joint space, but it's narrow. So I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming that this was potentially related to the injection. Okay, I, I, I read this paper when it came out. I kind of was like, eh, we do a lot of injections. It's not an issue. Uh, if you've ever read this paper, it's, uh, it's out of Hawaii. They looked at steroid injections in, the, in their group and looked at low dose, which was triamcinolone, 40 milligrams. They looked at high dose, which was 80 milligrams. And they looked at retrospectively, anyone, did anyone get rapidly destructive uh, wear in their joint? And if you look at the numbers, a single low dose steroid injection was 1% risk of rapidly destructive changes. 5% risk if you had multiple low dose injections or one dose of high uh, of 80. And then a 10% risk if you had more than one high dose inject injection. So I don't know for sure whether this is related to the steroid, but I'm I dropped my dose in half now. And I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but uh, this scared me. I, that this potentially happens more frequently. Yeah. What's your local anesthetic that you use for that? Or do you use any local anesthetic? I use 20 of Depo and I use uh, Ropivacaine 0.25%. And so Ropivacaine is the, at least if you look at the, the data, Dragoo's data, that 0.25% uh, Ropivacaine had the lowest risk of, of um, uh, chondrolysis or affecting con, uh, chondral, uh, chondral uh, health. Didn't he have a bunch of edema on the STI? Yeah, he did. Yeah. So I don't know. 
I, I guess I've never, I have never personally seen someone with edema on their, on their acetabular side. I don't know if it's like a second hit issue or phenomenon. I don't know what the, but I've never seen someone this young deal with issues like this. Somewhat close. Yeah. Yeah. After. I sometimes worry about these in like the knee. Winston. Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, you know, first of all, whenever I do a peer to peer, I, I kill them with kindness, right? They are my best friend because they have all the power in the world to make your life harder or, and make your patient's life harder or, or make it easier. And so I try to kill all my peer to peers with kindness uh, and ask them about their day and, you know, Tell them thank you for taking the time to talk to me, and and most of the time it works. I the uh, I don't like the idea of the injection. Uh, to I mean I don't know of many issues in orthopedics where you have to get an injection in order to move forward with something procedural. Uh, there's not very many options, or there's not very many pathology issues related to that, and it's based off of data that's not uh, great and you can find data to support the other side. And so if I have to do injections now to support because it won't allow me to uh, move forward with a procedure, I just do a local anesthetic 0.25% uh, ropivacaine. And if you, look at, if you look at the data for like what could potentially cause problems with chondral health, it's you know, the local anesthetics can as well, right? And, and it's, if the, the data would say that 0.25% ropivacaine is probably the least chondrotoxic, uh, but it's, it's time and dose dependent, right? So like 1% lidocaine, less chondrotoxic than 2% lidocaine, okay? Bathing a joint is not a good answer, all right? The, and the, we went through, you know, probably a decade ago, uh, the pain pumps where people were putting pain pumps in the joints because uh, it sounded like a great idea. That, that, that kind of makes sense, you know, bathe the, the joint with local anesthetic for a day or two. And there are young people that got chondrolysis from that. Uh, and, and so uh, there are some people who were really affected by, by that. And if you look at uh, steroids, the one that is probably the most risky is solumedrol. All right, Celest, or I'm sorry, uh, Celestone. And, and so it is, it is the most chondrotoxic, probably because of the preservative. It's a, it's a great question to, to ponder, but I think that um, it, it's probably still an answered question. It's unanswered. Because multiple loose bodies, it's, that may be more likely mechanical, just like when you get sunk in the knee, the chondral bone mm -hmm. is spongy, you start to flake off large chunks. If it's chondrotoxicity from chemical, you're going to typically injure the chondrocytes and then slowly lose the matrix, and you won't have big chunks. Yeah. So it yeah. just thins down like we saw in the shoulder with the pain pumps. Mm. You didn't see debris. You yeah. Saw it, it just kind of thing. Yeah. So it may be still on. That's a good point. Yeah. Good point. Uh, case five. How much time do we have? I'll be quick on this. So I just wanted to show you this because I think that this is important. This is a 12-year-old uh, individual, ACL tear, open physis, uh, prepubescent. I did an IT band ACL reconstruction on, on this individual. Two-week follow-up, follow it out six months later. Thing to notice here, slope, slope. A year later, year and a half later, okay? Closure up front, All right? Take out the bone, uh, the bone bridge, eight-plated posteriorly, 
got some correction. Okay. I, I think the issue here that I just want to bring up here, I'm, I get the exact complication of what I'm trying to prevent by doing a ACL in a technique that is supposed to minimize risk. I know exactly what we did uh, technically here. We, when we made our incision up in the front, the, the described way of fixing this was slit the periosteum, develop edges, tie your graft into the front. And that's how I was doing it back then. The developing of the periosteum went too far over to the, to the uh, front of the, the apophysis. And that's what happened. So suture, suture anchor, uh, and I medialize that point now. Uh, so technically it changes, but I think that, you know, that again, technical issues. Okay. The learning point was it really kind of made you think about what you do, how you do it. And I, I always counsel people regardless. And anytime I do surgery around a, an open physis, I counsel patients that despite changing up how we do things to try to minimize these risks, things can still happen. Okay. I'm going to skip the rest of my talk because we're running out of time, but questions. Um, with LC, uh, Lake Calvary Prophase or other ABN type problems yeah. around the hip. You see those? That's something new. I do. I, I struggle with with these sort of hip scopes. I I've helped some individuals. I I have not helped others. I think if I look at my personal I, my personal patient load, the ones that I'm not able to help are the ones that are more classic. Uh, the ones with with. Uh, more asphericity. The ones that I've been able to help are the ones that where their their sphericity is reasonable and they just have more of a bump up in the front of their neck uh, from their, their class, but they've got reasonable coverage. I, those are the ones that I, I can help. They're more mild. I, I don't need to. I don't have a great answer for for We kind of go in waves, right? Now you do something, you make something better, you do it a little bit more, and then you get then you kind of tuck your tail, yeah. After a little bit, you have a couple that don't that don't do well, and you tuck your tail and you get more conservative for a little bit. Great, thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know you're spending time with our Thanks, guys. I really appreciate having the time to come talk to you guys. You guys have a great, great uh, department and facility is pretty amazing. And you have to do it the same. Like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs>